Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stanford University Clinical Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine, Dr. Natalie Pagler. Hey. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I am a pediatric ICU doctor, but also have the incredible privilege to be the Chief Medical Information Officer at Stanford Children's Health. So here on the Stanford University campus in Silicon Valley, just about everything you could possibly ask as a CMIO. Uh, I also have the privilege of um, of helping to uh, start and co-lead our clinical informatics fellowship here on campus. Through both my CMIO roles and the fellowship, I've had the opportunity to take some of the, to work with collaborators across the campus and in the area, uh, in the Bay Area, to implement some of the great work that's being done and that you are learning about today into the hospital systems. Our next panel is going to be talking about radiology informatics, and this is a, a, clearly an area of huge opportunity. It's incredibly complex, there's, it's incredibly data rich, and there are so many opportunities to help frontline clinicians to improve the diagnosis and care of their patients. Our first speaker is going to be Kurt Langlotz. He is a professor of radiology and biomedical informatics here on campus. Uh, he um, is also our, um, sorry, associate chair for information services in radiology. He actually did his training back here at Stanford back in the 70s and 80s, um, was here for about 12 straight years, got both his master's and his PhD in AI-related fields. Um, and luckily has come back to us. He has been incredibly busy lately because he's been helping to lead our huge PAX implementation system, but thankfully was able to break away and come speak with us today. His um, research is focused on reducing diagnostic errors, uh, and he's, um, his laboratory has developed novel machine learning algorithms that provide intelligent assistance to radiologists, clinicians, patients, and consumers. We've already talked a lot today about some of the um, opportunities and applications of imaging informatics, and I know that we've several times touched on the question of will these technologies supplant our physicians, and I think you'll be interested to hear what Kurt has to say on this topic. So please help me introduce or welcome Kurt Lanelotz. Natalie. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you a little bit about our work uh, on artificial intelligence in medical imaging, specifically in radiology. Uh, I feel really fortunate to be a radiologist with an AI background here at Stanford in Silicon Valley right now when all this tremendous uh, work is coming to fruition uh, in computer vision. I'd like to talk today about uh, Medical ImageNet, which is our, our work creating a big data resource for machine learning on uh, medical images. And I'd like to start with a clinical case. So this is an 83-year-old woman who has an aortic valve replacement and congestive heart failure, and she periodically uh, needs chest x-rays for monitoring her condition. This is a chest x-ray uh, from a few years ago. And here's an x-ray from about 18 months later, and you can see there's a large mass that is projecting out of the right hilum. And if you actually look back to the earlier x-ray, you can see that there's a small nodule hiding behind a rib, behind the hilum, that was uh, not seen by the radiologist at the time. And so this is exactly the kind of thing that a radiologist on their best day probably would see. And certainly if we had some of these tools available, the radiologist would be able to identify this mass. So that's really our motivations for being here, is that diagnostic errors play a role in a large number of patient deaths. 4% of radiology interpretations contain clinically significant errors, and there are over 400 million US radiologic studies each year. So you do the math, that's potential for a lot of improvement. This is the work of Fei-Fei Li, uh, who's a computer scientist from across campus drive. She created 
what's called ImageNet, which is a very large uh, labeled database of images from the internet and has been responsible for much of the rapid progress in the development of deep learning models uh, in the recent years. And here you can see work uh, out of her lab, Andre Karpathy, uh, automatic. So these descriptions are generated automatically by a deep neural network. When radiologists see this, they say, hey, that's what I do, right? I look at images, I describe things. It used to be many years ago that if uh, I wanted to build a program to recognize, let's say, the left ventricle, that was a, you know, using old-fashioned AI techniques, that was a significant effort. Uh, it took uh, quite a long time to do that. This is Pete Solovitz, who's one of the fathers of AI in medicine, at a meeting not too long ago. In the 1970s, an AI system that worked for one patient was worth a master's degree. If it worked for three patients, it was a PhD. Now it's different, right? We can apply, if we have labeled data and we have the right configuration of network, we can build these systems in a matter of weeks. A lot has changed to enable all this progress. So five megabytes in 1956 versus a terabyte in 2016. And there have been similar uh, advances in the processing power uh, as well. And then we have these incredible neural network uh, architectures with large numbers of parameters that now can be implemented on this hardware and can process these images and provide classifications. So we're very much focused on what we see as a major bottleneck, which is the lack of imaging data sets to train these models. So we're building what we call medical image net, thanks to Fei-Fei Li for the use of that word. Uh, a cloud-based petabyte scale searchable repository of diagnostic imaging studies for developing these intelligent image analysis systems in medicine. This is a look at our Stanford radiology data. You can see the many different types of data. As Natalie said, we're actually going live, went live earlier this week on a large multi-platform clinical imaging platform for our hospital. And so as, as we do that, we're migrating the data from the old system to the new. As we make that migration, this is a half a petabyte, over a billion images, 4.5 million studies, growing at about 10% a year. We're creating a second copy, de-identifying it, and starting to put that in the cloud, where it can be available linked to the other data, so EMR data, tissue bank data, genomic data, where it can be used for these kinds of models. And having imaging data isn't enough. So we're also really paying attention to labeling methods. So we've done some conventional machine learning. We're starting to actually apply some of this uh, deep neural network technology to the extraction of concepts from radiology reports. So anatomy, pathology, uncertainty, modifiers. We have some rapid annotation tools uh, available to us as well that we've developed. And tools like a Google-like search of your radiology report database. So this is a tool called Montage, uh, where you, here I've searched for anywhere, any report containing tension pneumothorax in the impression section of the report. And so we can very rapidly create cohorts and create labels for these uh, systems. We're also experimenting with a new uh, open source software called uh, Snorkel, developed by Chris Ray's lab in computer science. That's a very interesting labeling technology. So what are we doing with all this data? We are developing deep learning models, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. This is work done uh, primarily by David Larson and a number of our other pediatric radiologists uh, using a multi-institutional data set, including some data from Stanford. Here, these are children who have developmental delay, perhaps, so they're being evaluated, and so the question is, what is their true physiologic age? Turns out one good way to do that is take an X-ray of the child's hand and look at the bone development in the metacarpals and the carpal bones, how ossified are they? And today, the high-tech way that we do this is with a, an atlas, a book, and you page through the book and you say, oh, seven and a half, that's about, yeah, I think that's about the same. Okay, this patient must be, have a physiologic age of seven and a half years. So this data was labeled by four radiologists and was also labeled by the machine. And then this is the, uh, the validation data set. And you can see here that uh, the, the machine, when compared to the mean of the four radiologists, compared to how the radiologists compared to each other, 
it was uh, a little bit better than a couple of radiologists and about the same as two other radiologists. So essentially human level performance that we're achieving with this particular model. So this is the first uh, of the set of models that has come out of this, uh, our laboratory. This is the work from uh, Greg Zaharchuk in the radiology department here improving the quality of images. So on the right, we have an MR image, which is a low signal to noise ratio image, uh, which was obtained very quickly. On the left, we have an image that is higher signal to noise, took much longer to obtain. We take the information from the left image, combine it with sequence, other sequences we obtain in any case, uh, automatically T2-weighted images, proton density, use that for noise reduction and can create this synthesized image using a deep neural network that's very similar to the longer sequence. So we're able to shorten sequences, potentially reduce the need for anesthesia in MRI, or if this were a CT image, reduce the radiation dose from that CT scan. Here you see the difference maps and it's pretty clear that this synthesized image is much better than the original image with no difference in imaging time. So some of the opportunities that we see here, uh, I've just showed you efficient image creation is one. Image quality control. So today, our technologists who obtain the images do quality control as a peer review. They take a small fraction of cases and, and rate them uh, on quality control. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a model that could automatically rate every case and provide feedback to the technologist and assure that that image is appropriate quality, contains the right anatomic elements, and so on. Workflow optimization. So I'm a chest radiologist. Every morning, I uh, come to work, and there are 70 ICU chest x-rays ready for reading. Those are obtained primarily to detect emergency events, things like tubes out of place, pneumo uh, tension pneumothorax, any other kind of new finding that may be an emergency for that patient. but I don't know which ones, it's a small fraction, which of those 70s contain those abnormalities. Wouldn't it be great if we had an algorithm that could go through and flag those, pull them to the top of my list so I read those first instead of waiting till the end of the stack? Computer-aided detection. I think the case that I showed to start out illustrates the need if we had a way to put a marker on something that had a, a suspicious uh, look to it. That would be very helpful to radiologists. We've actually been using that using good old-fashioned AI technology for many years now in mammography. Computer-aided classification. So I would call this a radiologist out of his or her comfort zone. So I'm a chest radiologist. Maybe I see something in the bone. I'm not a bone radiologist. Can the system help me by providing a differential diagnosis, providing similar cases, providing maybe some uh, resources from the web that might help me learn more about that condition? Particularly helpful in small hospitals that don't have the staffing in developed world, but also in the United States, I think. I mean, I'm fortunate I've got a bone radiologist right down the hall, but not everybody has that benefit. Um, and then finally, automatic report drafting. This is a real, I think, business opportunity for someone. So if you could imagine creating these classifiers for multiple conditions. So let's say the common things that happen on a chest X-ray, pneumonia, atelectasis, cardiomegaly, edema, pneumothorax, and so on. You had one, something to detect each of those. You could then synthesize the text associated with that. Here at Stanford, I'm fortunate to have residents, trainees who draft those reports for me, but in private practice, that's not the case. And there's a real productivity advantage to that. So that's something that would be intriguing potentially. I want to close with uh, the question of, is deep learning going to replace radiologists? So this is Jeff Hinton, who's one of the fathers of deep learning systems. He was asked what, you know, what some of his thoughts were. Let me start just by saying a few things that seem obvious. I think if you work as a radiologist, you're like the coyote that's already over the edge of the cliff but hasn't looked down so doesn't realize there's no ground underneath. We should stop training radiologists now, okay? <laughs> Uh, Harvard Business Review, robots will replace doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. Uh, the economist, Andrew Ng, who's in our computer science department, uh, says that, uh, you know, I'm more in danger of being replaced than my assistant. Uh, New England Journal, machine learning will displace much of the work of radiologists and anatomical pathologists. Okay, so how do we think about that question? Maybe we can talk about it more in the question and answer, but, so this is the cockpit of, a, of an Airbus A380. How many people would like to fly on a pilotless airplane today? Okay, not many hands. I've asked this many places, I don't get many hands. So you've got a highly trained person, highly perceptual activity, high stakes, lives at stake. And it's nice that that pilot has systems that synthesize the data, that present the data to them, and that help them with some of the more routine tasks. 
but I think we're all thankful that there's still a human being there. So I think that's one way to think about this question. Here's another way. So this is William Morton, who popularized the use of x-rays in the United States, and he partnered with Edwin Hammer, who's seated here. He's an engineer, so he knew how to run the generator to generate the current you needed to run the Crookes tube to make the x-rays in 1896. And I would say that radiologists have been bringing high technology in service of patients all the way through ultrasound, CT, MRI, and so on. If you think of MRI, everyone thought, you know what, it's such great pictures, you're not gonna need radiologists, the clinicians will be able to see the abnormalities, but in fact, the physics of MRI, knowing the pulse sequences, knowing the artifacts, knowing what's a real condition and what's not, is something that we train for and that we really own. And I think that we're gonna own just that same thing in these deep learning algorithms. They have their successes and failures. We're gonna learn how they can be used, when they're most useful, when to trust the information, when not to trust the information. So I think it's unlikely that that, that in fact is gonna happen. We can talk about technology and you know, uh, bank tellers. There are more bank tellers today than when the ATM came into being. Uh, and then lastly, the last uh, point I would make relates to decision support has been available and actually near or at the level of physician performance since the 70s. There have been very good systems. And if you look at the research that's done evaluating those systems, always the human machine system performs better than either one alone. And I know you've had some conversation about that before. So I'll close with this thought. Uh, the answer is, uh, the question is not will AI replace radiologists, but will radiologists who use AI replace radiologists who don't? Thank you very much.